your Bible and turn with me back to Luke chapter 2. And we're going to be thinking this morning, Luke chapter 2, from verse 25, about this gentleman by the name of Simeon, about which we know more or less nothing much uh, concerning his life story, his background, his, his family, his upbringing, education. We know that he lives in, in Jerusalem at this particular stage. We know that he is uh, old, he is mature in years. And we know that uh, there are a number of things recorded in this passage about him. And I'm going to give some attention to the details of this chapter this morning. Uh, but little else, little else is known about this gentleman called Simeon. But here he is responding to the marvellous events that have taken place in the last eight days or so that are recorded in the first half of this The context, of course, the invasion of the Roman army into the land of Israel, taking over, uh, defeating, installing their own leadership, their own dictatorship, and taking control of the country. And then, of course, this decree going out to Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed, everyone returning, a crisscrossing over the land uh, to their native place of birth. And so, therefore, we would conclude that Simeon was from Jerusalem because uh, either he was. Uh, had, had gone somewhere fairly close by to be taxed and and had made a very swift return to Jerusalem, or uh, that's where he was originally from. But nonetheless, uh, the miraculous and glorious happenings of that night on the hillside, yeah, the babe, and there's no room in the inn, all of those things are in this chapter. And so for that reason, they're so amazing, they're so wonderful, and they get so much attention. We can, if we're not careful, forget about Simeon and, and indeed that which I didn't read Anna the prophet's text. Forget about her. And we can forget about Simeon and his wonderful response to Christ's birth. But I want to not do that, give some attention to that this morning, and to think about Simeon and his response uh, to the birth of Christ. And I'm going to give you four thoughts this morning as we progress through these verses from verse 25, uh, going down. Uh, through the following verses, especially down to verse 30, but we'll go all the way to 35. And three, four thoughts about this man soon. First observation I'd like you to make with me that begins in his introduction to us. He is a sincere man. He is a sincere man. Notice, if you will, in verse 25, it says, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout. The same man was just and devout. So in other words, God is drawing our attention here to the fact that there are certain things about him that are important details for us to know, for us to observe. And the first one of those details he is not related to the birth of Christ, it relates to his own character, his own uh, individual nature. There are thousands living in Jerusalem. There's one man in Jerusalem called Simeon, and the Bible wants us to, to record this. He is just and devout, just meaning upright, righteous. In other words, here is a man of integrity. A man who is trustworthy, a man who is morally upright as well as in his practical earthly dealings. He wouldn't have had any problem uh, doing some kind of deal with, with this gentleman called Simeon. He was going to be reliable, he was going to be trustworthy, uh, he was just, and that's worthy of notice in the eyes of God. That the moral character of an individual is important. And we remind ourselves that that is said of J. 
Joseph. Jesus' earthly father, Joseph, it says in Matthew 1 that he was a just man. And it is said of a number of others as well. They are morally upright. I wonder this morning, could I challenge you? Are you an upright individual? Are you a, a just woman, a just man, a just child? That you are fair, equitable, righteous, and morally commendable. The opposite of that would be a little bit dodgy, uh, a little bit dishonest. Uh, so there's uh, a, a fair degree of what you need to do, you do, but then there's an underhandedness or a selfishness or a greed that sometimes creeps in. Just that. And event. So it puts those two things, those two concepts together. Uh, devout, we get the word devotion. It means uh, a, a spiritual dedication that there is something about this man that is not just upright in his affairs, but is spiritually devoted. In other words, that there is a depth to his Jewishness, his identity, the, the, the Jews have their identity uh, somewhat affixed with uh, their history, affixed with God, bound and tied up together with uh, who they were. They were, they were born Jews. You know that no one is born a Christian. Uh, they become one, not by their first birth, but by a new man. Uh, but they were born Jews, and so to them, sometimes there could be this falseness, this uh, superficiality. And we know that sadly, throughout the Old Testament, there are many who are outwardly professing uh, to be Jews and, and to believe in the Lord God, but had no inward sincerity. And how so very often the Lord has to rebuke his people through the preachers, through the prophets, and has to come to them and plead with them to turn to him, to seek him with all their heart. Well, here is a godly man who does seek the Lord with all his heart. And we see how that God blesses him and how God gives him uh, spiritual insight and gives him a place in the Bible, the joy of salvation. Likewise, there are, there are many promises to, to those that place their trust in the Lord, but do so sincerely. Um, as I asked you this morning, are you, are you upright in your dealings, in your affairs? But also, are you giving? Is there some depth to you when no eyes are upon you but God? Is there some sincerity or a true devotion within you to your God? What would you be prepared to sacrifice for him? What would you be prepared to do for him? Or perhaps significantly, more pertinently, what are you doing for him? You give up a, a little while every day to see him. I mean, be honest. You don't need to. Uh, you know, by now, I, I ask all these rhetorical questions and I ask them of myself as well as asking them of you. I, I'm not asking you to put your hand. I'm not asking you to walk out in front and admit, you know, well, you know, I, I neglected my emotions on the next day. But here is, a, here is a devoted man. Here is a man who gets in the closet. Here's a man who is, if you put those two things together, I think the scriptures are saying to us, here's a man who is genuine, who is sincere. We know that in the New Testament there were many that weren't genuine. There were many who said they believed. Really. We know that Jesus warned us about something. It's going to be tears. Far too often, it's only the weeks that really worry about that. 
when the Lord says uh, that many will say in that day that the Lord comes again in great power and glory to judge the earth. Lord, Lord, I prophesied in your name. I did this in your name. I did that in your name. But he'll say, depart from me, I'm getting to you. Because their profession of faith wasn't anything more than superficial. And there was no real repentance in their hearts. There was no real grieving over their sin. There was no real faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. There was no real struggle or desire to put on the Lord Jesus Christ to do that which was good and right. There was no true and sincere worship of God, adoration of him, and, and so the tears. One day there will be a separating these will stand between the sheep and the goats. In the tears that will be taken up and burned in the fire on the wheat that will be gathered into the barn. And it is my duty this morning to ask you, are you like Simeon, a sincere man? And by which I mean woman, child, man, whoever, are you sincere? The second thing I want you to notice, so as it goes on, he is a seeking man. A sincere man, he is a seeking man. Verse 25, it says, Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, the same man was just and devout, listen, waiting for the consolation of Israel. Waiting for the consolation of Israel. That tells me a few things more about it uh, than uh, uh, in my first appear. It tells me he knows his Bible. It tells me that he is reading his Bible. Do we have people here this morning who know their Bible who are not reading? Good often be the case. I haven't heard that before. I know about that. You know, if I if I spoke some false doctrine this morning and denied the Trinity or some other such thing, you'd, you'd be on it like a show. You'd know you know your life. What are you reading there? It tells me something about this man that part of his devotion was to study the scriptures. He, he had only the Old Testament, so he wasn't as blessed as we are. But he had those scriptures and he loved those scriptures. And it tells me uh, more than that, not only he knows his Bible, he takes a special interest in the promises of God. Uh, he takes a special interest in the promises of God. Uh, when you read the Bible, you will discover, you will know this, that the Bible is littered with promises, scattered through, all the way through. From Genesis all the way through to Revelation, there are promises from God to man. And if you are a man, that is to say you are a human being, then God is writing these promises to you. This, this is not a book that has been written and given to animals. This is a book that has been written as a revelation of Almighty God and given to mankind. And contained within this book, extraordinary and miraculous and powerful things. And many of those things that come as extraordinary and miraculous and powerful and wonderful are promised by God. Some of them are contingent upon nothing. The Lord is promising to do something. He's promising that he is going to uh, raise up uh, David as king. He does it. And that doesn't depend upon Saul or anyone else in the story. He promises that he is going to come again at the end of the world and judge the world. That doesn't depend whether you believe in that or don't believe in that. Or, you know, it doesn't make any difference. God is going to do that. But of course, the consolation of Israel is an interesting phrase. Let me just explain that phrase and then explain what it is that he is particularly focused on. It costs you, you, 
you were mocked, often they had enemies, hated, despised. Nobody likes, uh, if you're godless, anyway, nobody likes those who are in touch with God, who claim to be saved and know they, they, they say they know that they're going where they're going when they die. That isn't, that isn't the worst of it. It isn't just mockery and ridicule. It, it turns into actual hate, sometimes violent. This way out a consolation. That is to say, you know, there's there's no Christian here who doesn't have a consolation, doesn't have a comfort. You may be mocked for your faith or ridiculed for your faith or made fun of or laughed at or jeered or even worse. You have a consolation. You have something that they cannot take away from you. You read the Fox's Book of Martyrs, read the testimony of those dying saints, men and women and even children, uh, stake there uh, and burn in front of the whole village, or uh, put out at sea to let the tide come in and drown them, or hung, or had their heads chopped off. You listen to their dying testimony and their word. Never comes away. There is smiles beaming from ear to ear as they say, And they have a consolation. The Jews had a consolation. God had given time. God had made to them known his prophecy and exalted and favored them with preachers and prophets like uh, Elijah, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Micah, Daniel, and so forth. And interwoven throughout their history, he had given to them by uh, inspiration for scriptures, the holy oracles of God, and uh, Simeon, as he read these things, was comforted when he saw and discovered, aha, this is what God promises, this is what he's going to do, and no matter how bleak things looked, as he looked around him on the Roman invasion, all the taxing and all the soldiers that he must have seen in, in uh, Jerusalem, living in Jerusalem, and the change of government and Pilate being installed, Pontius Pilate being installed as the Roman governor over that region, and all that, that was going on politically and socially and economically was irrelevant. He had fixed himself on what God was doing and what God had promised. And look to God that God's people today were a bit more like. Because whatever's going on socially, economically, and indeed medically, uh, politically, and all the rest of it, whatever's going on, God is always moving and working towards his purposes and his plans and his goal in your life and on a worldwide scale. So he is comforted by the consolation of his wrath. He is comforted. You know, God has given us his word, and he's given us his revelation, and us his promises. It's up to us to live in the life, but that is what Simeon is doing. He is a sincere man, and he is a seeking man. And, and, and I, I want to point out, as we move on, it says that he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. An important word. Important. Could have said he was aware of the consolation of Israel. He was aware of those comforting, wonderful promises and the plans that God had to reach for the same and the Son, Jesus Christ. That's, that's the promise that he's, he's fixed on. Uh, this promise that's interwoven throughout all scripture. There's a Savior coming, there's a King coming, there's a Redeemer coming, there's a, a Lord that is coming. And he's fixed on that. He knows it's happening, he knows it's going to arrive. This Lord, this Savior, is going to be raised up for this needy world where the lost might repent and believe and be saved and forgiven and, 
and have access with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. He knows this. But he isn't just aware of it. He isn't just conscious of it. He's waiting for it. You know, as God's people, we have a great moment in God's word. Some of them relate to the friend Jesus coming again. Or when we die, don't be looking just far better. Uh, some relate to the small. Why all your need according to the riches in glory by like us? Or the blood of Jesus Christ his son cleanses us from all sin. Many precious Many of them. But are we waiting for? What I mean is we expect them to be fulfilled. So here is a man of great faith, a seeking man. So we have a sincere man, set before us this morning, a seeking man. And of course, what comes next? A spirit filled man. Notice verse 25, one more thing. It says, uh, um, Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem who sent to Syria, and the same man was just. Of the consolation of Israel and the Holy Ghost was upon him. Holy Ghost was upon him. Just the same as at Pentecost, when those disciples with that incredibly daunting, fear filling task that they must perform, needed to wait, to pray until the Holy Ghost, Ghost came. Upon. Then they went out with boldness. Here is a man, and the Holy Ghost is him to give him life and understanding, to guide and direct his steps, to lead him. Lead him by which I mean not just morally, spiritually. That is to say, the Holy Ghost is the guide. Of, of your affairs to convict, to, to steer, to direct you, but also in this case, literally, it says uh, that uh, uh, in verse uh, 27 it says, And he came by the Spirit into the temple. By the Spirit. So the Lord was leading him, guiding him, moving in his life, directing his footsteps by the Holy Spirit. So he's walking in. But the special thing that he emphasized, which is made plain to us, the Holy Ghost was upon him, verse 26, and it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord Christ. The Holy Spirit is the and it's interesting, paraclesis. That's the same word in verse 25, consolation. Comfort. Holy Spirit's name, the comfort of Israel comes when God's word is more than just black and white, uh, more than just words on the page. When it is made alive to you by the power of the Holy Spirit, and you are given light and understanding and insight, and you are being guided uh, through your daily pathway. Uh, but the special life, the special is understanding, which so many seem to be ignorant of, even at that time, is that he would not see death until he had physically seen the Lord's eyes. The Lord, you know, does give insights, personal and divine, wonderful insights. The Lord deals with his people, gives to us the Holy Spirit, his understanding, guide us, and to give us insight. Now, of course, we would be exceedingly well if someone came along and spoke some extraordinary thing that was partly to the Lord and claimed, well, that's from the Lord. The Lord's given me the insight. The Lord is not a God of confusion, the Apostle Paul. He's not a God that contradicts us. 
But he does very often give to us understanding, comfort, revelation, especially as we study and love and discover ourselves in his word. So the promise is rooted in the word. The Lord's Christ is coming. So rooted in the word, he then gives him a personal word that he would not see death until that happened. Wonderful. So he is a spirit filled man. And it is God's gift to his people that he has poured out his Holy Spirit still to guide us, to give us understanding according to God's word, give us hope in those promises. Here we have a sincere man, a seeking man, a spirit filled man. Going down to verse 28. Is the fulfillment of that which he had been living for a long time. <laughs> a satisfied man. Verse 28 says, Then took he, he uh, and he, he, verse 27, and he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the Lord, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God. I want you to think of that. Who knows? Is the Messiah. This is the Son of God. And he takes up this baby and everyone else sees the baby. And he doesn't see the baby. Kings, time, ordinary, living out. You know, you, you've all used the phrase and you've all heard the phrase or loved the way to sit. I've used that phrase many times, perhaps with a joke. Other ways. Because they want to know before it happens. God always tells us things before it happens in His world. The important things that we need. Hindsight is a tremendous one. Anyone can be very wise, very holy, and so on. We can't live. That way. We don't know the future. I'm not saying that, but, but there are the important things we do, and God has revealed them to people. Now, uh, here, Jesus, the Savior, is taking up his little infant in Simeon's arms, but this is what he says concerning him He's my Savior. He says, and took him up in his arms of 28, and blessed God, and said, Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. You might say, what by No, we look upon this, and we see as the Savior is and there. The agony, torment, and shame. That's our salvation. And yes, we look on the baby who is wrapped in swaddling bands and laid in mansions. That's our salvation. We look on the one who is walking on the water. That is my salvation. Powerful, the loving, the lowly, <clears throat> the gracious. Him ascending through the clouds, sitting at the right hand of the Father, and he said, The Almighty Jesus, he looked on a baby. He says, This now let us thou, thy servant, be part in peace. I can die now. And he isn't saying, He says, The part. That's a common word. I'm passing on. Paul says, the hour of my departure is at hand. You see that? You go to an airport, you'll see there's a departures gate, departures land. You'll go to the departures. What, what is it? Well, you're beginning your journey. You're going off somewhere. He said, now I can depart. So he isn't just that resigned. Well, I'm glad that waiting is over. 
I was fed up with waiting, but no, he's now looking forward. Now I can be part of it. Good why? Because his salvation is here. Because his Savior has come. Because his salvation is now. Now I, now I can be part. Be with Christ. Be with the Lord. Because my Savior is part. And he extends this promise very clearly. Not just for us. Not just for public, Not just for us. But for us too. To the end of the world. And he goes on and concludes this, what he says here. He says, For mine eyes have seen my salvation, verse 30, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people. So you know, you're familiar with this passage. It speaks to Joseph and Mary and indicates a little bit about the death that he will die. Here he is preaching the gospel. He, he's saying, my eyes have seen my salvation. But it's a light to light of Gentile. It's, it's the glory of Israel. Jew, Gentile, it matters not. Male, female, it matters not. Salvation has come. He sees in this day his satisfaction, his peace, his joy. So much so that Joseph and Mary Wonder oh, how significant, how meaningful that has been in their own years as he is raised up. I ask you, as I conclude this morning, uh, I ask you, are you sincere? I ask you, are you seeking this precious promise, believing in them? Trusting in them. What I mean by seeking is expecting them to be fulfilled. I ask you, are you spirit filled? Being led and guided, do you have light and stand in the scriptures? Never <coughs> guided by the Lord. Well, I ask you this morning, any sacrifice. We're looking to Jesus. The author and finisher of Perhaps there's someone here in the you, you're not like Simeon at all, you're not saying. We need to look at this, believe and trust in Him, personal Lord, personal Savior. You know, you could be going a sinful way. And perhaps there's someone here this morning and you are that student, and uh, you've made that perfection, and you repented of your sins, you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, and, and you would testify that you're saved, but yet you have taken your eyes away from not walking closer. You, you can look at Simeon or look again at Jesus. God of mercy and grace says, I will never leave you more. So welcome to you to open arms like the Father runs to the prodigal son. But one and all, look to Jesus. Keep your eyes upon him. You too. Mm -hmm.